being the CEO of Digital Bond, and then I'll go into uh, technical details and specifics about the CODISYS vulnerability. So I will turn the presentation over to Dale Peterson, who will uh, talk about some of the history. Okay, well, thank you very much, Reed. Um, yes, I'll just give you maybe a, a brief history of the last abysmal decade. Some people call it the lost decade when it comes to control system security, especially for the critical infrastructure. The, we really say the clock started on securing critical infrastructure control systems on September 11, 2001. There was a little work before that, but the level of interest and the level of effort went up dramatically at that time. Uh, here you see uh, Senator Lieberman actually had a, a committee meeting the day after the attack. Um, DHS was founded. Um, there was actual um, organizations developed to look at securing control systems that run things like the electric grid and chemical plants and pipelines and things of that nature. So vendors, owner operators, uh, the governments around the world started to really care about uh, critical infrastructure cybersecurity at that time. Unfortunately, um, we've made very little progress since then, but there has been some progress, and I, I don't want to just gloss over that. Uh, if you look back in 2001, most of the SCADA and distributed control systems, the really important ones, were directly connected to the corporate networks. Um, they, there was no security perimeter around them. That's changed now. Most of them do have a security perimeter with varying degrees of effectiveness. Uh, some patching has begun, although, again, that's, that's always a tough thing. Items like uh, giving users unique IDs and, and improving security logging and monitoring uh, has been going on, and we've made some progress in that. Again, some companies and some sectors more than others. When we look at a SCADA or a DCS, you can kind of divide it into two sections. Uh, one would be the components that run on traditional workstations and servers, typically Microsoft or, or Unix. And these would be things like your operator stations and control rooms. They're sometimes called HMIs or your historians or SCADA servers. And you will find that some of the leading vendors, the ones that have really been taking security seriously, actually have designed some strong security controls into these, strong authentication, encryption, better security logging, um, a number of different features into their products that you can actually buy today. And probably the other thing that's equally important is they've been implementing a security development life cycle for three to five years. So some of those very common, simple bugs uh, that lead to vulnerabilities have been wrung out of their products. So I would say if you're going to buy a control system today, there's actually some good news when it comes to that part of the system. But just to be fair, there's still a large number of vendors that haven't taken security seriously. We've got uh, just a massive amount of legacy code out there. So even on this uh, better side of the story, you're going to see an increasing number of ICS vulnerabilities as attention is increased and then testing and hacking on these goes up. Now the, the sad side and what we're really focusing on today is the field side, which would be the PLCs, the RTUs, uh, IEDs, and other types of controllers. And we have made quite literally no progress on this as, in, as a community in the last 11 years since 9-11. Here you see an example of a PLC. This is an Allen Bradley Control Logix. And the reason these are so important is these are the devices that are actually talking to the sensors to get the monitoring data that's displayed in the control room and used to make decisions. And they also are connected to actuators. So these could be uh, sensors, things that uh, make something spin faster or heat up or control a recipe. The PLC is actually the thing that is closest to the process. So if you want to affect the process and you can hack into the PLC, that's kind of your end goal from a cyber attack. 
Now, in preparing for this, I went back uh, in the Wayback Machine and looked at the Digital Bond uh, blog. And we began our SCADA security blog back in 2003. And I thought I remembered it, and it actually happened. Uh, Eric Byers gave a demo that we covered in the blog back in 2003 at the ISA Expo. And you can see it here, just a short little blog. But what he showed was if an attacker was able to have logical access, so they could ping a PLC, they could turn things on and off, uh, make things go faster or slower. They could upload new logic. They could download complete password files, upload ladder logic. They could do all these different things. And it didn't take a sophisticated attack. And we knew this back in 2003. So a lot of times you'll hear when you talk about PLC security, you'll say, well, everyone knows this is a problem. And quite frankly, that's true. Obviously, we were doing uh, demos at conferences, people in the industry back in 2003. One thing I really want to focus on here, because it comes up a lot, is most of the time when we're talking about PLC and the lack of security in them, it's not what you would normally call a vulnerability. It's actually insecure by design. And what I mean by that is an attacker does not need to find some programming error, some buffer overflow, or some other coding error that they can then turn into um, some sort of exploit program to compromise a PLC. They really don't need to do that because the PLCs are lacking ba basic security controls. So for example, I think the biggest problem is there's no authentication. So if you want to turn something on or off you, and you have access to the PLC over a network, you can do it and the PLC will accept that command. There's no authentication. You can change the way a process works and we'll talk more about that. Or you can even upload your own firmware onto these devices. And one of the real challenges is that uh, when, when we have a new researcher working on a PLC, you can do just about anything you want, including things that will brick the device. Um, so it's a real easy attack to brick the device because it often happens by accident. So this is not, as I said, this is not a vulnerability. This is the way they are designed. And today, a real attacker, if I can steal a phrase from Ralph Langer, uh, a real attacker would not look for a vulnerability he would use a feature. And what Ralph says is that's how the professionals do it. Of course, they're full of other problems, as you can see listed here. And I'm sure you know, once you get past uh, these insecure by design issues, I'm sure there's many programming errors like there is in a lot of other software that wasn't designed with security in mind. OK, I'm going to step forward here. And I'm actually going to uh, talk briefly about three different S4 presentations. Um, S4 is a technical conference we put on every January in Miami Beach that really focuses on ICS security research. And after seeing that demonstration in 2003 and everyone realizing it was a problem and not seeing any progress, uh, Daniel Peck, who was with Digital Bond at the time, actually did a research project to load rogue firmware into PLCs, including that uh, control logic that we showed the picture of earlier. And he was able to do this. And in this case, he actually loaded, um, loaded his own logic into the PLC or his own firmware that then created like an ICS worm that would look for other control logics PLCs and then load firmware onto those. Now, this was not something new. Uh, actually, Idaho National Labs and DHS called this the Boreas vulnerability. But it was just one of those things people talked about, but you never saw. So we thought maybe if we showed uh, the community this issue, maybe they would care about it and actually put some authentication onto the firmware upload. I can tell you at this point in 2012, that same problem exists in the control logic. And if you want to see this presentation, uh, there will be some links on the web pages uh, related to this webinar that you can watch this and the other uh, videos. But 
at the time, we we kept this information, I guess, just inside the community. We didn't really make a big deal about this and tell the world about it because it was still kind of this closed, very niche community. That all changed with Stuxnet, which I know everyone probably on this uh, webinar has heard of before. Um, if you want to see sort of the definitive Stuxnet presentation, I encourage you to watch uh, Ralph Langner's Stuxnet Deep Dive because he goes through uh, line by line the ladder logic to show what they did. But the key thing was they changed the ladder logic in the S7 PLC, and you can still do that today. All the, all the Windows exploits and other issues that Stuxnet did, and it was very complex, the end goal was to change the ladder logic in that PLC. And what they did was very similar to what you see in a movie. If you watched Ocean's Eleven or Speed, you've seen these cases where uh, security cameras pointed at something valuable that the good guys or bad guys want to steal. So what they do is they just record the image with no one there, replay that through the security camera, and the guards say, oh, everything's fine. They did exactly the same thing in Stuxnet. Um, and if Ralph walks you through this in the ladder logic. They, they recorded the centrifuges operating normally. Then when a trigger went off, they made them spin faster, but they sent the normal beta, I'm sorry, the normal data back to the control room. So the control room said everything's fine, but things started breaking. And when they did their analysis, they said, well, it should be fine. They were spinning at the right speed. A very clever attack, an example of what you can do if you can upload your own ladder logic. So after Stuxnet, the world knew that, uh, that these PLCs were vulnerable. And in fact, the level of effort on the offensive side really ramped up uh, in countries and non-government organizations. And you can see this just by the hiring that's going on right now, uh, the number of openings around the world looking for people with ICS security experience uh, for classified government programs is huge now. So we decided to do something a little more aggressive in this year's S4, S4 2012. We did Project Basecamp. And there were six researchers in Project Basecamp, uh, led by Reed Whiteman. Uh, there was another IOActive employee involved, uh, Ruben Santa Marta, who did just some amazing work as well. And we gave these researchers the PLCs that you see below there. And we said, let's see what you can do with them. Now, there's a 90-minute presentation that Reed gives um, if you want to see a lot of good PLC hacking and, and, and problems and Metasploit modules. I highly encourage you to look at that. But much like we expected, because the PLCs were insecure by design, if you look at the second bullet there, it was a bloodbath. It was really ugly how, how easy it was to do serious compromise on these PLCs that are widely used in the critical infrastructure. Here are the results from Project Basecamp. You see across the top the, the five vendors that had equipment in Project Basecamp. And then down the, um, down the left column, you'll see the different types of attacks we asked the researchers to do. Now, the way you can look at this is the red X means it was trivial to implement that attack. So something that might take an hour or two at most. The yellow exclamation mark meant that it was possible, but a little more difficult. So this was something that would take uh, maybe one day, two days, three days tops. And then the green check mark meant that it survived a few day effort of the attacker trying that attack on that equipment. So you can see uh, we're looking at a lot of red X's and, and very few green check marks. So it was, it was as ugly as we expected. If I can just point you to the, the, second, um, the second row there with the marks in it, the ladder logic, that is Stuxnet. So uploading rogue ladder logic is a Stuxnet type attack. And you see they were all vulnerable to that. And you can also see in the first row there, they were all vulnerable to uh, loading rogue firmware. 
and this, this is because there's no authentication in these products. And then the final slide I have is we didn't want to stop with just saying these things are really bad um, and doing a presentation. One of the things that's really important is that the owner operators understand how how easy it is for these PLCs to be compromised and at what, and at what risk their systems are at. So we developed proof of concept Metasploit modules and this is a partial list of them. And these are with the main Metasploit feed now. But you can see, for example, um, down at the bottom, you can make a control logic stop or crash. And it was a real difficult attack. All you had to do was read the documentation, get the stop code, and program that into a Metasploit module and send it to PLC the command to stop. Again, insecure by design. If you look at the Schneider Modicon, um, the lat rogue ladder logic upload, that module will actually load um, a non-malicious ladder logic file into the Modicon device. But you can create whatever ladder logic file you want to as a proof of concept. So if you have any of this equipment, I'd encourage you to download these modules and actually show people so they understand the risk to their system. Now, at um, this was kind of the end of Project Basecamp from the first phase. And then when we started to look at what we should do next, uh, we got some people telling us we should look at this 3S code assist system. And that's what Reed is going to cover in more detail. Thanks, Dale. So I'm going to show the, uh, the technical details about the code assist vulnerability or quote unquote vulnerability as I like to call it since it's really just an insecure by design issue. So first let's talk about what code assist actually is. 3S Software is this German company that decide, they saw this problem. They saw that uh, lots of PLC manufacturers were implementing the wheel over and over again. So when a PLC manufacturer makes a PLC, they have to make hardware and then they also have to make a uh, set of code to run ladder logic on that hardware. Then they also need to make a nice graphical interface or integrated development environment for a PC for what they call an engineering workstation so that a user can write ladder logic and then transfer it to the PLC and have that code run. So code assist decided that they were going to fill this gap, or 3S Software decided that they were going to fill this gap using the code assist tool. And they said, why don't we make an IDE and a ladder logic runtime that will let manufacturers focus on making the hardware of their PLCs. And this had a nice benefit too, which is that uh, an engineer that's used to programming one kind of PLC that uses code assist can easily switch to another set of hardware, switch to another manufacturer, and they'll understand how to use the software and they'll know the terminology that code assist uses for doing their PLC programming. So a PLC, which Dale talked about a bit, is a programmable logic controller. It's really just a hardened computer that has inputs and outputs on it. And those inputs and outputs are usually optically isolated so that they can handle surviving in a harsh industrial environment. So when I talk about PLCs, I always like to give a, a beer brewing example, which is a PLC would be hooked up to some sensors and actuators on a beer brewing mash tun. And the input would be hooked up, for example, to a thermometer on the mash tun. And there might be output connected to maybe a relay that controls a heater as well as a valve on the match time. So a ladder logic program would tell the PLC to keep the temperature of the, the beer between 153 and 156 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour so that uh, you know the beer is a, a nice consistency and can go on to a fermentation tank. The PLC program would say if the temperature drops below 153, turn on the heater. If it gets up to 156, turn off the heater. And after an hour timer is done, keeping it in that temperature range, open the valve so that the, the mash can go over to a fermentation tank. The PLC also has this extra feature, which is that it reports data to a human machine interface. They might report to an HMI and say, you know, here's the temperature of the mash, here's the color of the beer as time progresses, it's getting more amber in color. And it will also do alarming. So, for example, uh, if, you know, sometimes in the real world, things don't work like you expect. 
perhaps the heater on the, the mash tun broke or the valve got stuck and it would set an alarm so that an operator looking at that screen would know, hey, something's wrong on the plant floor and I should go down and check out the equipment and make sure that everything's working. So when we talk about all this PLC insecurity by design, it's important to look at a bit of the history of a PLC. So PLCs, you know, first designed in the 1970s and 1980s spoke serial protocols. They were connected to isolated serial networks. So these were, you know, companies running these PLCs didn't need to worry about security. And the serial protocols that these PLCs spoke had, had no use for security. There were no big networks back then. So as uh, PLCs moved forward in time, they were updated with Ethernet. Because if you've ever worked with a serial network, they are a pain in the butt. Uh, serial networks, you know, you have all kinds of uh, difficult issues to deal with on them. So you have to, you know, terminate your serial network and you have reflections and you have, you have all this physical layer stuff on the wire that you have to deal with. So PLC started to introduce Ethernet more frequently in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, but they decided uh, in the interest of saving time, a lot of these vendors, that they would just use those old serial protocols and layer them on top of Ethernet-based protocols. So they would just take an old serial protocol and encapsulate it in TCP and use an IP stack and put it on the Ethernet network. So the trouble is that we have a lot of these old serial protocol uh, methodologies for designing security, but now we have these PLCs connected to Ethernet networks, and we even have quite a few of them connected directly to the in Internet. And so now we have a greatly increased risk. So Dale talked about some of the, the project base camp highlights, and basically it was that a lot of PLCs are insecure by design. They lack basic security, and they lack any security to change the, the program, the ladder logic program that runs in the PLC. So some of those PLCs presented security fear. So they acted like they asked for authentication, but really it was authentication performed on the client or on the engineering workstation, not on the PLC itself. Some of them had other ways to bypass that fake security. So why did we go after code assist? Well, CodeAssist is used by 261, maybe more, different vendors. There are 261 vendors listed on 3S Software's website. Uh, so, and the CodeAssist software is run on these PLCs that run in a lot of different sectors. So, you know, we see CodeAssist used in the electric power industry, oil and gas, mining. I'm sure that it's used in water, although I haven't seen a specific example. But it's just used in a lot of different sectors. So we thought if we could convince 3S software to add some basic security features to code assist, it would be great, right? It would be like one fell swoop, you could secure a lot of different verticals that are using the software. So here's what the code assist software looks like when it's running on an engineering workstation. This is a view that's um, a bit similar to Visual Studio if you've programmed on Microsoft Windows. So what this is is a, a project, and it's called PLC underscore PRD. This is a, a really simple project that you, know, you can navigate project files on the left-hand side using this hierarchical view. And then on the right-hand side of the, the code assist environment, you can write your program. So we see on the right-hand side, uh, programs are separated into two parts in this language called STL, where you have variable declarations and then you have the program itself. So in this example, we're just declaring an integer in our programming language, and then in the actual program body, we're assigning it the value of one. So in the body, you could also have uh, to, you know, output toggles and input decisions uh, made based on what's, what's going on in the real world. So once you've written your program in the code assist IDE, you need to load it into a PLC. And so you do that from within the IDE. You just go up here to this online menu, and you click the login button. Now, the login button can prompt for a password, but what we found is that that password is being checked in the CodeAssist software itself. What happens when you click login is a quick query goes out to the PLC where the software asks the PLC, hey, do you have a password set? And then the PLC responds with yes or no, and then if it's yes, the, the software prompts for a password. We found that we could actually delete the password, and we'll cover how that works. But once you've logged into the PLC, 
You can then select this download option that you see on that menu, as well as uh, run the new code or stop the currently running code on the PLC. Another feature of the Code Assist software is this debugging feature. And it's under the PLC on the resources section. And it's this thing called the PLC browser. And what that PLC browser gives you is a, uh, like I said, it's, it's a debug option. It's kind of a command line interface available via the Code Assist protocol. So when you click on the PLC browser, and you have to be logged into the PLC to, to open that, that, when you click on that, you get on the right-hand side of the screen, you get uh, this kind of asynchronous command line interface. In the top text entry box, you can enter commands, and in the bottom text area, you get responses to those commands. And if you type in an invalid command, it will actually still send that command to the PLC, and then the PLC will write back in the text window you know, commands not found. Uh, and it's worth noting, you know, inside of this debug window, you can do a lot of different things, right? You can start and stop the program that's running on the PLC. You can look at memory and set memory in the PLC. Uh, and there's usually a bunch of other commands just for getting information about, you know, the running process as well as what operating system the PLC is running. So behind the scenes, that, like I mentioned, that password verification isn't enforced by the PLC. And if, um, if a user did set a password on their PLC, we can use that PLC browser function and run this DEL PWD command. And that actually clears the password, and running that doesn't require authentication. And you can do that with one of the tools that was released as part of that Project Basecamp release. So, uh, on the Digital Bond website, there are two demonstration tools available for the, the Code Assist vulnerabilities. The first is the Code Assist Transfer Program, and that lets you upload and download arbitrary files. So you can upload new ladder logic, but using a directory traversal bug, you can actually grab and overwrite any file on the PLC. And some of these PLCs run Windows, some run Linux, some run deeply embedded operating systems that don't have other files that just have ladder logic. But using that, um, that ladder logic upload capability, we're able to run what I call the Beresford Stuxnet attack. Right? So Stuxnet uh, affected the engineering workstation and overrode the behavior of the engineering workstation so that an engineer thought that he or she was uploading uh, one set of ladder logic when, in fact, they were uploading a, a Trojan set of ladder logic. Well, Bill and Beresford looked at the same Siemens PLC and realized that he could run this attack without having access to the engineering workstation. He could just run it from the network. He didn't need to, to be as uh, complicated as the Stuxnet people were. But either way, you get loss of integrity, right? And then there's this other benefit of the, the uh, well, maybe not benefit is the right word, but this other problem with the way that ladder logic works on the uh, code assist software, which is that you get arbitrary code execution. And I talked about that at the uh, AppSec DC conference in April of 2012. And there will be links on the webinar website about uh, you know how to see that video. Um, so basically, you can run any code that you want. It doesn't have to just be ladder logic, but it could be shell code, for example, on a PLC that's running this code assist software. And then we also wrote the code assist shell Python script that gives you access to that PLC browser debugging shell. So that lets you, you know, list files on the PLC and also allows you to remove a uh, password using the DEL PEWD command. So about that arbitrary code execution, and like I said, if you want to see details of the file formats and uh, how you would actually do remote code execution, you can see that at the DC talk. But, you know, a lot of people would say, well, who really cares about that? Because what you're really showing here is that if you can upload real ladder logic, that's what really affects the PLC. Well, it turns out that uh, the, some PLCs, anyway, that run this code assist software have uh, an interesting network uh, feature. And so, for example, with the Wago 758870, which is the PLC used to develop the tools, uh, it actually has two network interfaces in it. And one of the neat use cases of that is that you can set one network interface to be a master for a bunch of subordinate field devices. 
And then the other interface can be the kind of upstream code assist interface to the HMI and engineering workstation. So effectively, you can make a WAGO 758 870 be like a point on control system where the ladder logic gets executed and it will in subordinate field devices. And so arbitrary code case again, and here's a network diagram of what I'm talking about. In the center of this diagram, sensors that speak SCADA protocols like Modbus and what have you. Uh, and if an attacker can get on the network that's the same network level as the engineering workstation and HMI, arbitrary code on the Wago PLC and cause that Wago PLC to turn into a flat out router, then the attacker can pivot off of the Wago PLC and attack the subordinate PLC or the extra sensors that, like the Wago, aren't going to have security built into them. So that's kind of why the arbitrary code execution matters in the context of uh, an industrial control system. So some people have produced uh, IDS signatures to try to detect the code assist attacks. And I think it's a really good idea to try. I think in the case of a lot of these insecure by design PLCs, it's really difficult to be successful. The, you know, insecure by design, but what we're really doing when we attack the engineering workstation and HMI system and figuring out how to use that legitimate traffic in a new way. So the packets that I send to uh, my Wago 758 are no different from the ones that are sent to uh, the 758 by the actual code assist software. So the IDS signatures that have come out actually mislabel legitimate use of the CODESYS software as an attack. And it took about 30 seconds to modify the attack code to evade detection, right? It turns out some of those packets that the CODESYS software sends to the PLC uh, aren't really necessary, and those are the ones that are used uh, for the detection. So, I mean, it's really, really, really difficult to you know, detect attacks generically when you're looking at some protocol that's insecure by design. If there was security that was being bypassed in some way, it would be a little bit easier. The one thing that you could detect with an IDS signature and that I think you could detect pretty accurately would be the directory traversal issue, which is that I can read and write to arbitrary files. And normally the code assist protocol only writes to the ladder logic file. I don't think that any vendors would write to other files on the system. It's possible that they would. I really don't know. Uh, but it seems that if you looked for, uh, you know, the, did a kind of a deep packet inspection of the code assist protocol and looked for dot dot slash notation against Linux systems or dot dot backslash notation against Windows systems, you'd probably be able to detect that, that kind of attack anyway. So what I'd really like is to see a focus on the fix. Uh, so CODASYS PLCs are used in critical infrastructure, right? These systems that run CODASYS are used in substations, and they are used in, you know, oil and gas and, and those other areas. And so for now, I think you should protect your network, probably using network ACLs. Uh, if you're not doing it already, start. But really plan to rip and replace these PLCs with more secure ones soon, or at least start hounding your vendor and say, hey, when are you going to uh, have a fix for this? Because a few of the vendors that made or that use code assist, I know of two so far, have actually uh, implemented some extra security features on top of the normal code assist runtime that help mitigate these vulnerabilities. I wouldn't say that it's a complete fix, but it goes a long way to fix it. So in kind of summary, um, Insecure by design is still insecure, right? We're referring to these sort of as vulnerabilities and sort of as insecure by design. The end result is the same. A bad guy can easily do bad things to your, your control system and, your, and to your process. We've had over 10 years now of, of people saying, we need to secure these PLCs. We need to you know, add some basic security. For the most part, vendors haven't taken any action on in that 10 years, though. So I would just give a, another plea to vendors. Uh, you know, if you can implement even basic security, 
like even just uh, uh, non-encrypted, I don't even care about that, but if you can have some kind of authentication for performing these privileged operations like ladder logic upload and download and uh, configuration changes, a little goes a long way in this space. Um, and hopefully over the next couple of years we'll see more and more vendors take up the slack on this because I really don't want to have to give this presentation in another 10 years talking about more insecure by design vulnerabilities and DLPs. So with that, um, if there are any questions, you can email to uh, webinar at ioactive.com. I would highly recommend checking out the Digital Bond Project Basecamp website uh, and also checking out the ioactive blog for more updates on PLC vulnerability.